All right, let's try that again. So do we have audio this time around, guys? You tell me. Nobody's looking yet. Take a look now and tell me what you got. Don't you love it when technology doesn't work the way you want it to? <laughs> oh, the old, hey, unplug it and plug it back in. Restart. Hey, how about we try this one more time, guys? Well, I'm back in the studios, you can tell. Where was I last weekend? I was at Barber Motorsports Park playing... Uh, on their racetrack with my car. Although my car let me down. See, it even happens to me. Everything was checked out, ready to go. Had it out on track. Noticed it was braking a little bit squirrely. And I'm like, man, what the hell's going on? Front brakes looked fine. Went and looked at the rear end, lifted it up. Looked across, outer CV joint. Ripped all to shreds. I don't know what got to it. Of course, then it threw grease all over my rotor and the brake pad. So. We were done for the weekend. Uh, not that I couldn't straighten out the brake side, but where am I going to find a uh, another CV boot uh, at that location? Plus, that's not something you take apart at the track because it's an interference fit. Not that you needed to know that. But hey, we still had a good weekend anyway. So let's start off this Friday by swinging around to anything I may have ma missed last Friday. I think there were two things. Um, I can't even remember the guy's name, but I can get to it real quick. I believe it was. Big CG75. He asked me for the valve clearance on a 2005 GSX F750F Katana. Well, here it is. What are they for the intake and exhaust? Intake is 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters. Exhaust, 0.2 to 0.3. Of course, you want to measure those cold. So, told you I'd come through for you. No big deal. Was there any other questions that I missed on the live part? Ah, let's see. Is Chris with us today? Yeah, Chris, there you are. Guess what I've got for you. Gonna have your name on it, dude. And I'm doing more than just sending a few stickers. We actually filled up your box. Tell you what, just for fun, we're gonna autograph it for you. <laughs> so come Monday morning, this box is gonna be heading your way. Great signature I have, huh? <laughs> Yeah, Chris is with us just about every single time we go live. So, hey, why not reward him a little bit? What the heck? All right, as for any other questions I missed, now that I'm having to restart my computer and everything else attached to it, open up. Sorry, I really was prepared for uh, to get going, but not when the computer doesn't want to play. Nice. <laughs> All right, I, I tell you what, these uh, these handles, that they just blow my mind sometimes. Herb and Smoke had asked me, would a bad stator cause no spark? I replaced the plug and the ignition coil. Typically, your stator is not going to be associated with your spark because your spark is going to be getting its timing cues from this, possibly the same harness, though, because it's going to have a, a pickup coil. And that's basically telling it when to fire. So is the stator the problem? I doubt it. It's probably the pickup coil that's associated with that same wiring harness, though. Fake name has asked me, hello, I could use some advice about my carb. PZ30 on a 250cc. I have no idea what machine that is coming off of, but hey, let's keep going. Bike dies when choke is fully off, but runs when choke is set to halfway. Carb was cleaned very well, was it? Air, screw, air fuel screw is currently set to two and a half turns out. What I'm wondering is, could the position direction of the holes on the sides of the main jet nozzle be a possible cause for this issue? As 
And do the holes need to be cl uh, clocked a certain direction? They are not clocked. Okay, you're talking about the uh, on your main jet, the the emulsion tube is what I assume you're talking about. It has the holes that are up on the sides. And no, it doesn't matter which way that is turned because it's basically just swimming in the, uh, the bottom of the float bowl itself. What you are describing is your, your, your idle circuit being stopped up. And the only way it's getting fuel is for you to force it through by choking the engine. So uh, it was cleaned very well. I'm not doubting your ability, but on a lot of your smaller carbs, especially for something like a 250 and under, Chances are that that, uh, that pilot jet is still stopped up. If not the jet itself, the air intake for it, which is going to be on the Venturi side. So you really need to make sure you get all that cleaned out and blown out. Otherwise, it's going to respond like yours is. So I think you got a little bit more cleaning to do. So let's try that again. Rail, rail Rotor had asked me, is it possible to overfill the, the rear differential? Well, of course. I had to pour almost an entire bottle, uh, eight ounces, before it came out. I'm running a No. 15 Rancher or a 2015 Rancher. Yeah, we did uh, one on a 2012. We did a front and rear differential service. So if you want to check the playlist for ours, I can walk you through it. I don't remember it taking in an entire eight ounces. Uh, you're saying that it, it came out the weep hole. If, if I'm facing the back side of the machine, and that you know this is the front your your fill cap is basically all the way at the top and it's that huge one with the 17 millimeter um, socket if i remember correctly drain holes all the way at the bottom and over on this side is going to be your weep hole and it's only about that far up on the bottom of the gym differential case itself so should it be more than eight ounces i really don't remember it being that much i thought it was more like you know three or four Go back and watch that video, but to answer your question, as long as you're not completely overfilling it and it's just continuously, if you've overfilled it and it's continuing to run out that weep hole, leave it uncovered for a while. Let it go ahead and flow out. If you accidentally pour it in, I don't know, three ounces too much, uh, it may take a little while, especially if it's cold, but um, as long as you are sure that you've got that, uh, that weep hole uh, bolt pulled, and I think... It actually has it stamped on the side of the uh, differential cover or the differential housing itself, um, diff fluid inspect or something like that. I, I can't remember. can't remember at all, guys. But <clears throat> as long as you let that weep out, it should be fine. So, yes, can you overfill one? Certainly. If you let it settle down to that level, you're going to be fine. All right. Let's see what we've got on the uh, on the chat. All right, cool. Got a few questions or comments. Uh, Steve, New Zealand, John Grizzly, set of Grizzly 550 runs fine. And then at times, not every ride after 30 minutes of riding, the idle will start to race. If I switch off and restart, it seems, seems to settle down. That's an interesting, interesting one, Steve, because uh, what, well, let me ask you real quick, what year is it? And I assume that the, the 550, that's going to be fuel injected. So I think this is going to be a uh, more than likely a sensor problem and uh, because it's telling it to, to idle up. Uh, the, your ECU is telling it to I idle up. So something in turn is telling the ECU I need to idle up. So I wonder... If uh, one of your sensors, maybe your throttle position sensor is sending some false information to it and making it uh, act a little weird. But, uh, give me the year on that one and uh, I'll look a little bit deeper into it. But uh, no, I haven't run up on that one before. But chances are, I'm about to lose my voice, chances are um, your ECU is getting some false information that's causing it to idle high. Long story short. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Somebody, you're a hard man to lip read. Yep, that's why I had to restart. <laughs> I can't read that name. Hello. Hello back to you. Uh, JG, hey, hey, JT, all the best from England, UK. Well, glad you dropped in to spend a little time with us. Your boy Sham Shep, 400EX, did rear carrier bearings. Now, when you try to <clears throat> tighten the caliper um, to bracket, it pulls itself onto the rotor causing it to drag. 
um, have taken apart? Am I missing anything? Checked manual. All right, let me think this through. Did the rear carrier bearing. Now when you try to tighten the caliper bracket, it pulls. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, when you, you put it back together, um, you set your, your tension um, on the, uh, the carrier itself, and then you've got those, um, I think there's either four or, yeah, I think there's four um, number six millimeter bolts on the backside, which clamps down onto the carrier. And you're telling me even after you tighten those down, it's still trying to inch or is trying to rotate forward? I wonder if you've got those torqued correctly and they're a little bit deceiving. You'll need, you don't just do it once. You'll need to make about three different passes to get all those tightened because you'll go through once and it'll, it'll set uh, or it'll activate your uh, torque wrench. But then you go back again and you'll notice that first one that you tightened, it's going to go a little bit further and go across. So you need probably need to go through there about two or three times to get that all clamped down evenly. Chances are it's not, torqued correctly and that's allowing it to uh, rotate in the how uh, in the uh, swing arm itself chris r why'd you rotate and why'd you uh, remove a message are you talking bad about me <laughs> norwood sportsman 570 atv stuff hey john i'm mechanically inclined and i was wondering if you recommend a novice try to tune an HMF slip-on exhaust on a Polaris uh, 570. It's, it's not that tough, especially if you're just doing a, a slip-on. Um, there isn't a whole lot of changes that you'll need to make to it other than maybe uh, adjusting just the uh, the air fuel um, uh, on air fuel screw, bringing it out maybe another half a turn or whatever HMF uh, um, recommends. Because uh, with just doing the slip-on, you're, you're just dealing with the, the last part of the exhaust system. It's not like you put a gigantic header on there where you're having to compensate you know, your air fuel to an, a, a wide or a big extent. So no, don't be afraid to do that. Go ahead. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, do, 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 do. Your boy Sham Shep came back. Everything seems fine. I've done these before. Never had this issue stumped. Hmm. Oh, Chris did respond, dude. <laughs> you got thanks, you guys at PZ. Not a problem. This is uh, this is fun for us. So why not uh, why not reward people that uh, come in here every week and listen to me babble for you know thirty minutes at a time? <laughs> We're glad to have you. <clears throat> All right, um, I I can't make out your name on this one. He says, "Is this broadcast dedicated to something specific?" Or can I ask anything related to motorcycles? Say anything you want to. This is just an open format. So every, whatever you want to ask me, fire away. JG said it best. Any questions, John, we'll try to answer. You got it. And if I don't know, I do have the... Uh, I can access a lot of different uh, supplies to where I can find out the answers. If I don't know off the top of my head. Because... Because I can. <laughs> Mark J8. I have a Polaris 325, two stroke, isn't it? 2001. And when I accelerate or go up hills, it makes a loud clicking noise, maybe from the transmission. All right, on that 325, is that a two or I think it's a four wheel, uh, it's, it's a four wheel drive version, isn't it? Or four, uh, four by four. I would hazard to guess if it is because I'm a little bit, uh, I think I've seen one in my past. I think I'd be looking at your uh, your CV joints up front, see if they're getting stressed or worn out and starting to pop. Generally, when you hear that kind of that click, 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 click kind of sound, that's usually coming from your constant velocity joints. And boy, do I know about those. So I would say, uh, take a look up front and see, uh, see what you see. Best way to do it is just lift up the machine, rotate it by hand because you're trying to ride it. Yeah, that's too many sounds going on at once. So it's the best just to isolate each section and get a feel for it. And I think you're going to find something up front. Noah Finley, do you have a favorite vintage Yamaha Enduro? Matter of fact, I do. Um, way back in my early career, one of my friends named uh, Andy Woodard, he always had the cutting edge motorcycles. And we were all just blown away by his 1973 DT 
175. I believe it was a 73. This one had this beautiful blue gas tank with a with a gray pinstriping around it in front of the factory and this huge chrome uh, gas filler cap. It was just the coolest thing ever. I mean, all of us were either on 70s or 100s, maybe even a 125, but there was Andy with his 175. I, I never owned one, but uh, I had uh, Enduro Envy, I guess is the best way to uh, to categorize that. But yeah, if I, but if I was going to go back and buy you know a machine from my past, I'd probably look for one of those. There's a lot of cool memories associated with that particular machine. Ty Lyle. Hey, John. First time here on the stream. Well, welcome to the stream. My 08 GSXR 600 tends to wobble or lump when using the front brake. I've changed the brake pads, but it still happens. Any thoughts on this? Yes, more than likely. It's, it's not that your front rotor or rotors are warped, but over time, and depending on what type of brake pads that you're running on there, you can get deposits of brake dust. I know it sounds crazy, but that'll cause the, the front end to, to wobble. And when you're under braking, it, it, it'll shudder. And probably the only way you can straighten that out is, well, one of two ways. Either get a, uh, they make these different attachments for drills where you can clean off your your pat or your your rotors or just replace the rotors. I mean, it depends on how much you're willing to, how much time you're willing to spend or how much money you're willing to spend. But it, your rotors, they're not warped but they have a buildup of uh, brake pad material or dust that's causing them to, uh, to make the pads jump in and out. I've had it happen a couple of times on a, a track car when I did not properly bed in the brakes. And that's the real trick is to get an even layer of brake bedding when you first put on, uh, especially a new set of rotors or, and or when you're changing over to a different style or formula of brake pads themselves. That's more than likely um, what you're what you're running into. Uh, Steve from New Zealand said, "Hi, John. To confirm, it is a 2014 fuel injector in injected. Well, uh, my original um, my original uh, advice um, is, is the same. I would I would bet that uh, it, it's going to be something that's telling the ECU incorrectly." Uh, uh, telling the infor information or relaying incorrect information to the injectors on it. Mark J8 is a two-wheel drive. Okay, so that Polaris 325 is a um, it was just a two-wheel drive. That being the case, man, I'm trying to remember that machine. Was it chain-driven, Mark? If that's the case, take a really close look at the condition of your sprockets and see if they're just worn to the point where they're kind of arcing over and now they're starting to catch the backside of the chain, especially when it's under a lot of torque. So take a look at that very carefully, especially your front one. The back one, it'll hide it for a while. The front one, they really start to get hooked and uh, chances are that's what it's doing. Um, big uh, CG75, never got the valve clearance specs for my bike. I did order a manual, supposed to get it thirsty. I may have started out with that information on the, the stream that um, that we had to kill because we didn't have any audio. But guess what I've got? <laughs> Your valve clearances on the intake is 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters. And on the exhaust, 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters. Just make sure you measure them when they're cold. I told you I'd take care of you. <laughs> but yeah, if you're really going to dive into this, Go ahead and get a manual. So it sounds like you've already done that. So it's the first step in uh, getting all these, uh, getting these machines fixed. Chris R. <laughs> I figure busting your balls about the audio just after you showed up, showed me the mystery box was out of order, deleted. Oh, okay. Good enough. Yeah. I haven't actually shipped it yet. So you have to be nice to me at least till Monday. <laughs> Uh, Mark eight, yes. So that is chain driven. Uh, train chain driven. Can't talk this afternoon. Then yes, take a really close look at your uh, the condition of that, especially that front sprocket, and see what you find out. Um, I'll be curious to see what you find on that one, Mark. So let us know. 
low end gamer. Hey, John, do you think anyone needs a 450 or should they just get a 250 instead? Well, it really depends on what you're after um, in your your riding ability. And when my son came up through the ranks, of course, he had an 80, then a 250, and the uh, and the 450. Um, when did he make the jump from the 250 to the 450? When he was pretty much abusing the 250. I mean, it, he was just physically too big. And it, even with the suspension bumped up as much as I could, I mean, he'd go over jumps and it just sounded like it was killing the poor machine. So that's when he met, when we made the decision to go to the 450. So he, your body's going to tell you when it's time to step up from a, to a, a larger machine. Now, which one did he have more fun on? I don't know. I'd say it was about equal. And, uh, he definitely loved that 250, but it was, uh, he was always, he was riding it to the point he was about to get hurt on it. And that's why we decided to move him up to the 450. Outrageous penalty. Hi, legend. God bless. Well, far from a legend, but God bless you too. Well, all right, guys. 327. I caught up with most of the questions from last week and got some of these answered this week. Up, up, up. We got one more. JG uh, chimed in. Ty. I try um, some scotch white pads and use warm and soapy water to clean both sides of the disc. Wipe clean with a shop towel, then use brake disc cleaner spray on shop towels and wipe until towels are clean. Very good advice. Um, as long as they, there isn't too much buildup, what JG is suggesting, sh should, suggesting should work. Good grief. <sighs> Can't talk today. That's part of my job. Good grief. Well, all right, guys, I'm going to duck out of here. Go get this shipped off to uh, Chris. I think they're still open down at the D.C. or across the street. So uh, I'll go ahead and get that thing shipped out to you. Well, everybody, thanks for swinging by, spending a little time with us. And also thank you for shopping here with us at Tartzilla because that makes all of this stuff possible. And God willing, we will get together next Friday at 3 and we will do it again. Y'all take care.